A lot of us have gotten lukewarm in our faith because you're not plugged into the spirit of God that'll keep you passionate and on fire. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not about the temperature of the content. It's about what are you plugged into? Are you plugged into prayer? Are you plugged into the word? Are you plugged into worship? Are you plugged into forgiveness? Are you plugged in? Because when you're in that, it'll warm you. Why is he getting so riled up now? I'll tell you why. Because if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, there are things that you have to be turned up about. So um, I work out with a friend of mine named Dave and Doug, two friends. But my buddy Doug bought me this Hydro Flask. Any of you have one of these Hydro Flasks? This is an amazing product. Okay, one person likes it. Great. Um, But this Hydro Flask is amazing, and I love it so much. Thank you so much, Doug, for buying me this gift um, because I use it all the time. I carry it with me all the time. I used to have um, a Yeti. Um, Anybody ever have one of those Yetis? Nice nice things. If not, go Getty. Um, I got bars for days. I'm from the Bronx. You know that rappy. I got the Yeti. Go Getty. Ask your girl Betty. Okay. Um, Let me... (laughs) It's coming off the rails already. So, so anything that you put into this, like if you've got cold water, it keeps the water ice cold for like 24 hours. This is an amazing product. Or if you put something hot into it, it'll stay hot for a while. And I love this product. I use it all the time. In fact, I'm going to use it right now just to refresh a little. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's a really good product. I love it. The thing about this product though, it's only guaranteed to keep the temperature of the content that's poured into it. So if it's cold, it'll stay cold. If it's hot, it'll stay hot. What's poured into it will be poured out of it in the same way. But for many of us spiritually, we're not poured into anything. And sometimes we're not poured out to anything either. And for too many of us, we have a problem. The beautiful thing about this is that it keeps things at the temperature it should be. And sometimes a lot of us go through life in a context that's supposed to keep us at a certain temperature, but we either don't pour into it or we don't get poured out of it. Our audience can be divided into three categories today. Number one, those red hot and white of flame with passion for Jesus. Number two, There are those that are cold and disconnected from your relationship with God. Number three, there are those in the messy middle, that messy place called lukewarmness. You're just kind of here. You're just kind of going through life. You're lukewarm. And at our church, we have a value. We put our heart and our soul into everything that we do. It's our passion value. And I love this value so much because so many of us face the temptation of living our entire lives relationally, spiritually, financially at room temperature. Just kind of allowing yourself to be whatever the temperature of the room is. How can we find out what our current temperature is spiritually? Well, today we're going to get into the last book of the Bible, this book called Revelation, where seven churches were written to with an admonishment from Jesus. They had seven different characteristics, seven different personalities, if you will, and they also had a particular temperature in each church. Now, we need to remember that these were letters that were written to people that had put their faith and their trust in Christ. These were believers that were being written to, and there could have been unbelievers in the midst, but this is primarily speaking to people that were Christians. So if you're here today and you don't know what you believe about Jesus or his church, today you're going to learn about the type of church that Jesus wants to build, and hopefully you'll make a decision that you'll want to be a part by coming to him in faith. And this church is called Laodicea. It's a lukewarm church. It's a place that none of us really want to be in. Laodicea was in what is now known as modern-day Turkey. It was built around a trade route, making it a commerce center. It was a great, bustling city. It was affluent. Excavation showed that there was a lot of things that were happening there. It was situated on a high elevated plain, which should let you know a little something about the culture of these people as we dig deep into the text. It was situated on a plain, which means that it was easy for them to look down on everybody else. 
They got arrogant and they had a centralized water system that piped in water from two cities near, nearby. We'll find out what those two cities are later, but the water, when it arrived into their city, was lukewarm. One city provided hot springs, Another city provided cold, refreshing water, but by the time it got down to their city, it was lukewarm. They had a polytheistic culture. They worshiped many different deities. They had incredible wealth and affluence. Sounds a little bit like where we live, right? An earthquake destroyed the city, and they needed no outside help to rebuild. Y'all, they didn't need a PPP. They didn't get a stimmy. They just rebuilt the city out of their own affluence. And this book was written by the Apostle John, a follower and friend of Jesus. And the book of Revelation is filled with prophecy and visions that are sometimes hard to interpret. But the words we're about to read are very, very clear. Jesus speaks to John and tells him, write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. He says, write it to the angel of the church, meaning the pastor, the leader of the church. Your boy is feeling so good today because that's the only time I've ever called an angel. Here it is in the text. Thank you. Feeling kind of angelic today. This is great. As with all the letters written to the churches, Christ opens up with a salutation about himself. He starts saying, I am the amen. The word amen is there to affirm truth. He is the beginning and he is the end. He is the faithful and true witness. So Jesus is saying, I am emphasizing my reliability of truth. And then something unusual occurs as he continues to talk to the church. Now, for those of us that lead people, whether in a volunteer or managerial or or even an executive level, you have people that report to you, you know that when you're about to correct somebody, you do the compliment sandwich, right? You say, hey, you're an amazing employee. We love you so much here. You add so much value, you contribute. But you know what? You messed up. Your performance is horrible this month. The sales are terrible. I don't know what's going on. You were late for the last five weeks, but we really value you and love you and think that you're an awesome employee, right? You start off with a compliment, you get at them for whatever is wrong, and then you end with a compliment. Everybody does that when you're leading others, except here in the text, Jesus gets right at it. He says, I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. He indicts them saying, you're not hot with righteousness, but you're not cold with disregard either. You're not passionate, but you're not fully reprobate. You're not against the teachings of Christ, but you're not advocates for my teaching either. You're not overly sinful, but you're neither overtly zealous for my presence. They had a form of godliness, but they were indifferent to it in reality. In a great sermon by the wonderful preacher Charles Spurgeon from many, many years ago, an earnest warning against lukewarmness, he says, this is the type of church that has prayer meetings, but only few come. This is the type of people where they attend meetings, but they're still dull because they're afraid of getting too excited in their worship to God. They're content to have all things done decently and in order, but their zeal is next to zero. They have schools, Bible classes, preaching rooms, and all sorts of agencies, but they have no energy to display any goodwill toward them. Here in the verse, Jesus says, I wish that you were hot, passionate, committed in relationship to me, or... I wish you were cold. And I'd rather you being flippant about Christ because at least then if you were cold, I could get you warm or you could desire some warmness. So Jesus says, I prefer extremes. He says, I would rather you be cold or I'd rather you be hot. But since you're like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, now, in this text, we're reading this verse, the translation doesn't actually translate it the right way. The word spit there actually means to vomit in Greek. God says, I'm not even going to spit you out of my mouth. You nauseate me. 
I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth because lukewarmness causes me to react in this way. And Jesus is doing something very profound. Everybody in that city knew that they had lukewarm water. They were piping in cold, refreshing water from Colossae, a city, and another city. They were taking water from hot springs. And by the time it got there, it was tepid and it was lukewarm. And Jesus says, hey, you are just like this water in your city. And you guys think you're so amazing. He goes on to let them know that you say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need anything. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. These people are all invested in their own sense of wealth and affluence. And Jesus is like, you guys think you're the Westchester Mall, but you're the Galleria. <laughs> you're the gallery, I'm not coming. Not unless you put the DMV in there, I'm not coming. <laughs> They have this sense of pride about who they are. And let me just say something to you, everybody. False deception always leads to self-deception. That's why you have to be a self-aware person and that you have to be accurate about how you think about yourself. If you're self-sufficient and self-satisfied but not Christ-dependent, this is what happens. He says you don't even know who you are and what you are. You ever read the childhood story, uh, The Emperor Has No Clothes? Two swindlers arrive at a capital city of an emperor who spends lavishly on clothing all the time, and they somehow bamboozle him to believe that they can make clothes that are invisible, that only people that are foolish and stupid would not be able to see. And the townsfolk uncomfortably go along with this pretense. They don't want to appear inept or stupid until a child yells out, the emperor has all no clothes. Little kid comes out of kid's life and just says... Hey, have you noticed? <laughs> I think that the American church has been walking around, strutting its stuff, not knowing that it's spiritually naked. Until a documentary says, hey! Until a scandal says, hey! Until some pastor does something inappropriate, some church has a culture that abuses and uses people, and they say, hey, you're naked. Listen to what Jesus is trying to say. He's saying, be passionate now. Get right now before you have to get embarrassed because you're too self-sufficient. The church absorbed their cultural surroundings, and they became spiritually snobbish. Oh, we are the church. We are the place to come to. We are the ones that are the bastions of righteousness. And the culture's looking back and saying, oh, really? And Jesus is looking back and saying, okay, no, no, you're wretched, you're miserable, and you're poor. He tells them that they're blind. And you have to know that this is such a profound use of Jesus' direction to everything in their culture. See, this was a city that was famous for its medical school. They had the first Old Testament version of Visine. They made eye salve. So they were renowned for people that had eye ailments would come from far to get this salve. And Jesus says, you're producing something in the natural that you don't have in the spiritual. You're blind. You may be producing Visine for everybody else, but you can't even see that you are blind spiritually. You're walking in your own abilities. And then he says, you're naked. Why does he tell them that you're, they're naked? Because they were famous for producing this glossy black wool. And we're going to find something out here in the next verse that's profound. Everybody was dressed up in this black wool and they were so, so um, engrossed by this idea of having this, this textile that everybody wanted. But yet for all, Jesus says, you're naked. That wool that everybody's coming for you, no, don't even. I know, you know, all black is cool, makes you look slimmer. But to me, you're naked. And a lot of us church people don't remember the feeling of thinking your life was fully together because you had everything you needed. A lot of us don't remember what it's like to have a life without Christ. We're so accustomed to having money to hang on the weekends, clothes and a vehicle, and we don't remember what Christ -like, Christless life was like. In fact, you might be saying, listen to this text, well, I'm not rich, man. I can, you know, I got bills and so on. No, you're rich. 
If you don't believe you're rich, why don't you just fly to Haiti today and go see how people are living? You're not rich. You chose what sneakers you were going to wear today. You didn't know if you wanted to wear your cute high heel boots or if you wanted to wear your suede ones. You had a choice of what type of clothes you were going to wear. You had a choice of what kind of food you wanted to eat this morning. We are rich compared to every other nation in the world, perhaps. We are rich people. And spiritually, we can get so arrogant because we don't think that we are in a state of spiritual poverty. Jesus says here, I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also buy, here it is, white garments. What is he doing? He's making a comparison. Everybody's dressed up in black wool, but he's saying, hey, put on white garments that represent my purity, represent my work. From So he says, you won't be shamed by your nakedness because the thing that God doesn't want for any of us, regardless of what you believe about the Bible, is for you to experience shame. God is always trying to rescue you from guilt rescue you from the things that we've done, rescue us from the feeling of shame. And maybe you're saying, well, I thought righteousness couldn't be bought. Jesus is not inferring that we need to buy righteousness. It's a way for us to understand how we should approach him. No one can actually buy things from Christ. He only uses this word as a medium to carry thoughts to us so that we can understand. In other words, he's saying, you're spiritually bankrupt, but I'm going to give you something that's pure in nature. If you come to me, I will robe you in my righteousness, not yours. You'll get robed in my finished work, in my finished performance, not yours. And that's what the good news is that we don't have to operate in our own ability, in our own righteousness, trying to be perfect, trying to be holy. Jesus said, I've already transferred my righteousness to you. Get white garments from me. He says, come to me and I'll give you the eye salve so that you'll perceive things correctly. And, and here's where we're going to get into it a little bit, because a lot of us here at this church, we love jazz hands, Jesus. Yeah, you do. You love that Jesus like, I'm going to bless you. How can I bless you? Doesn't matter what you do. I'm just going to bless you. You know, Broadway Jesus. He's just over here jazz handing all the time and all this stuff. What we don't want to, listen to me. Jesus came and died for our sins so that the wrath of God didn't have to be on us. I want you to understand that. But Jesus loves you, which also means that Jesus has to correct you and I. Because who a father loves, a father chastens. Uh, he says, I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Have you ever seen kids that have not been disciplined? <laughs> yes. Have you ever wanted a job to be a professional child discipliner of other people's kids? <laughs> you have an itch to discipline somebody else's kids. You're just watching the kids just act out. You're like, Lord Jesus, help me. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus. Here's what, what look, those whom I love, in one other translation, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. In other words, God corrects us, and we have a poor theology that says God is only supposed to bless us, but I can tell you, because he loves us, he disciplines us at times. That doesn't mean he destroys us. It means he puts us into the right place. He corrects us. He allows us to know that we're going. Listen to me. If you have friends that won't correct you, friends that won't help you, they're not good friends. He says, turn from indifference. The ancient Greek word for zealous is also the same word for hot. He says, get zealous, get hot again for me. The Laodicean church is a lot like American churches right now. Comfortable, well-to-do, lukewarm in commitment, camouflaging their Christianity, blending in, perfectly able to be apathetic and lethargic instead of being passionate. And listen to me, everybody, because I know that there are some people in this room, you've gone to churches where the pastor abused you. I'm not talking about sexually or anything like that, but the culture of the church was, let's use these people. We need you to do this. We need you to do that. They were rough with you. They, you know, they preached against sunshine. You, you're not supposed <laughs> You, God doesn't want you to have a tan. God doesn't want you to smile. 
God doesn't wash it. Anybody ever been to one of those churches that was more rules than there was relationship with God, right? Like those cultures have smothered us sometimes and then when you get corrected in another culture, you feel triggered, like there's trauma. Can I say something to you that's gonna help you? Because look, I've been a pastor, my wife and I have led a church for 13 years and I'm pretty sure there's some people that have left the church and thought, man, that guy's too turned up. But I've never, ever deliberately, I'm pretty sure they've said that. <laughs> Because a little bit too wired, man. <laughs> but, but, but we've never created a culture of abuse. Here's the thing. I want more for you than I want from you. And, and, and here's what I want you to know, too. Just because there's documentaries and films and this and that, and pastors have made some dumb choices. I'm doing the best that I can to live my life transparently before God. I'm not in nobody's DMs. I'm just good. <laughs> I'm I'm not nobody's DMs. You're not catching me sliding. I'm the wrong person to flirt with. I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to be doing ministry for a long time. My wife is right here. She'll tell you. She knows. And I, you want me to tell you a joke? Let me tell you a joke. Can I tell them this joke? This is so off script. This is the second one. This is so, this, I didn't do this in the first thing. So I, I went, Tim will attest this. And I want, Tim is our next gen uh, director. He's amazing. <laughs> This is so off the rails, but I'm going to do it, right? Just a real time. I just feel like preaching real, right? So Tim can attest because you try to get at me this week. So I'm going to correct who the father loves, he corrects. Tim and I went to a, a leadership training thing down in Delaware. And we went for lunch. And then when we came back for the session, they got everybody coffee from Starbucks. So, <laughs> I, Tim drove me to Delaware. Am I right, Tim? And I, <laughs> I was sitting in the passenger seat of my vehicle. She was driving with me this week and in the, I had a leftover cold brew and it said Abigail on it. Now, my <laughs> so when she was getting out of the car, I said, hey, can you throw this away for me? Because I'm done with it, right? Didn't say a word. Took. <laughs> Went to the house, didn't say a word to me. An hour later, she calls me. Um, who's Abigail? <laughs> I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. She said, Abigail. <laughs> Abigail! <laughs> so the Starbucks cup. I said, oh my God, class, it's the people that ordered it. Tim, was it not Abigail? <laughs> Thank you very much. I just want to let you know, this is why I don't travel no place by myself and preach, because it could have been horrible for your boy. But Tim, <laughs> accountability, everybody. I'm staying passionate for Jesus. <laughs> I'm going to pass until I'm 90 with no documentaries. All right, so. so <laughs> 60. All right, so let me, this message has come off the rails, but it, it feels good, right? All right, so listen, everybody. I love hot tea. And I love iced tea. I've never gone somewhere and ordered a lukewarm tea. Talking about tea. Every Caribbean person knows that you have to love tea, especially Jamaicans. You could go to your mom and be like, mom, I have stage four pancreatic cancer. She'll be like, drink some tea. <laughs> I just got shot nine times. You, you drink any tea yet? It's facts. It's facts. I love hot coffee. And I love iced coffee. 
I've never gone to Starbucks and said, let me have a grande lukewarm blonde roast. Never. We love hot things or cold things, not lukewarm things. In fact, Pastor Jim told me just a little while ago that medicinally it takes your body no energy to ingest or digest something lukewarm. Only things that are hot and cold cause your body to react and put, and put energy into something. So, so I love Sylvia. Sylvia's on our team. I don't know where she's at right now, but she's an amazing. There she is right there. Sylvia's amazing. One of the, honestly, one of the greatest people I've ever worked with in our church in 12 years of ministry. And she serves our church and our family so well. Love her. And the Lord has blessed her with a barista ministry. And um, part time, the woman of God can do some things with Java that is holy almost. Just Holy Spirit doves in your latte and all that stuff. But no, she, she, she sometimes will make coffee and she makes amazing coffee in the office. And there's times like I'm busy, so I'm running around and I'll get some coffee or whatnot. And then it gets lukewarm and I hate lukewarm coffee, but Sylvia knows how to just make coffee perfectly. And recently I got this gift that Sylvia always uses. Let me show it to you. It, here it is. It's called an ember. Have you seen one of these bad boys yet? Oh man, between a hydro flask and an ember, oh, grrr, you got to get you one of these. <laughs> Hey, I'm telling you, this is an amazing product. I love it because when you pour in the contents into it, it stays piping hot all day. That coffee all day will be the same temperature, piping hot. Hey, let me tell you why it's piping hot all day. Because the ember is plugged into something that's got power. Oh, I wish I had a little talk back today. Just a little bit of time. Look, the reason why it can stay hot all day is it's because it's connected to a source. It, it, it's connected and plugged into So One of the reasons why some of us are lukewarm in our relationship with God is because we're not plugged into prayer. We're not plugged into the word. We're not plugged into worship. We're not plugged into a life group. We're not plugged into other relationships. You're not plugged into your marriage the way you want to be. But if you want to be piping hot, on fire, by the Holy Spirit, you got to stay plugged in to God. See, you're like, why is he so energetic and whatnot? Listen to me. You should have seen who I was when I wasn't a Christian. First in the club, first to twerk, first person. <laughs> I mean, I'm down, ah, back up. So you think I'm gonna come from a context, if we fighting, we all fight, what's good? We, we all in, even if, you know, everybody was piling up, I'd be like, yeah, yeah, son, go ahead, get it. That was me. <laughs> Loudest, shortest. <laughs> but all in. So why in the world would I come to a relationship with God when I know what he saved me from? and put me into and turn my energy down. Look, something has changed at the Life Church New York. We're serious about our mission, our vision and culture. Something's changed in me. I'm on fire for God. I'm doing the best that I can to live out my faith. I'm passionate. I love people. I'm obsessed with people. I'm obsessed with this church. So that means something has to change in you in order for something to change in Westchester, in the Bronx, in Fairfield County, and all across this region. And Jesus was consumed by the love for his father and his house. Hmm. Oh, I, see, we love jazz head and Jesus. Jesus is just like, hey, how you doing? Da -da. Oh, you guys doing good. How can I bless you? Oh, bless you, bless you, bless you. But, but Jesus wasn't always that way. Re remember that time when he came to his father's house and he saw people who were selling doves? He told them, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. And I can prove to you why I believe Jesus might have had some Jamaican in him. <laughs> One other passage in the gospel say that Jesus went and made a whip. And then came, that's how you know he was Jamaican. <laughs> the kids acting up, they're like, let me find something. Wait, wait, wait. Let me. They'll make weapons of mass destruction to discipline their kids. My dad, how, how, 
You want to you know another funny joke about how I, I believe God has some Jamaican in him? You ever hear Jesus say, my father is always working and so am I? <laughs> you got to read the Bible and have fun, man. So Jesus, he doesn't come in with jazz hands. He comes in and he starts turning tables over. He starts moving out the money changers. He starts wiping everybody out of his father's house. He's angry. He's turned up. He is all the way up. Why? Because he's passionate about his father. Not only that, the reason why he was so upset was they set up their, their, their merchandise, their commerce in a place where Gentiles, people who didn't have a relationship with God, it was the only place for them to connect with God. And when Jesus saw that the place where people who don't know his father was being corrupted and turned into a commerce center, he drove everything out. Why? Because our father's house has always got to be about people that don't know him yet. And so what happens? The scriptures say, the disciples remembered, oh, this prophecy from the scriptures, oh, I see what's happening. Passion for God's house will consume me. They saw it. We love our football teams. One of us here on the front row loves his baseball team. That's why they lost last night. Because <laughs> we love our coffee. We love our smartphones. Is it possible to love our church? I believe so. Because if you want to be like Jesus, it seems like you have to have a passion for the Father's house. Can, can I say something to you as I come to a close? Because I feel like singing again, right? We just, just feel like we just need to sing today and just declare some stuff and just, just do it. Let, let me just say, hey, everybody, not everybody can work for the church, but everybody can work as the church. Not everybody here is called to work for the church. It would mess some of y'all up. Y'all be like, whoa, there's so much stuff. I didn't know that this is what goes into building a church. Not everybody can work for the church, but everybody can work as the church. No one had to check Jesus' temperature. You want to know why? Because he was a thermostat. So the question is, are you going to be the person that changes the atmospheres? Here's how you do it. You have to get rid of, and I have to get rid of, my addiction to security, significance, and satisfaction. We have to start living our lives not worrying about tomorrow, what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, where we're going to go, what we're going to do. Stop coveting the new, shiny, bigger, brighter, deeper thing and be content and to feel joyful regardless of where we land financially, emotionally, and relationally. Like the gospel doesn't promise us to have suffering free lives, but what it does, that's why I love that song. I still have joy in chaos. Like, like I'm good. And, and that's what's otherworldly. Listen, Jesus says, and you gotta pay attention to this because I believe that this is what's happening to many of us right now. You're like, why is he knocking on the pulpit? Because Jesus is knocking on the door of his church. He says, look, I stand at the door and knock. Have you ever wondered why somebody who owns the house is on the outside knocking to get in? He says, if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Wouldn't it be sad if everyone felt welcomed and loved at this church but Jesus? And he's knocking on the door of maybe your heart right now saying, hey, you've been a little bit lukewarm lately. Hey, you haven't been as committed. And the beautiful thing about Jesus is not, he's not going to knock at the door to condemn you. He's going to knock at the door to say, hey, can we come in and share a meal together? He, here in the text, the word sharing a meal together literally is not talking about a hurried snack. He's not talking about fast food. He's actually talking about sitting down in a non-leisurely kind of way and having a main meal, speaking of fellowship, wanting to connect with. God is trying to get through to some of us today. You've lost a little bit of your passion. You've lost a little bit of that energy and that drive. You're not witnessing to your friends maybe the way you want to, not just by being the Christian that's like, hey, do you want to come to church with me? Do you want to come to church with me? Do you want to come to church with me? No, no. The type of Christian that's just like, there's just something so different about him or her. I just like their energy, their vibe. Listen to me. Those who are victorious, Jesus says, will sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Jesus is always giving a promise when he knocks at our doors that if we'll open the door up, we'll find out that he has better life for us. Most of us in this room don't have a bad life. 
And you don't have to have a bad life to be a Christian. I'm just telling you that there is a better life, better alternatives, better choices, better results when we put our full trust in Jesus and when we get passionate. I'm talking to people that are church hurt. I'm talking to people that are relationship hurt. I'm talking to people that have had bad experiences at their job. You're not a joyful person. Do you feel the spirit moving into your soul today? Knocking, 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 saying, hey, hey, I, I, I want you. So what's the temperature of your relationship with God? Because anyone with ears to hear must listen to the spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. If you're here today, this is no judgment. I'm raising my hand. I'm struggling with introversion, as you can see. And, and, and I want to be more passionate for Jesus. Is there anybody here that is a follower of Jesus saying, man, I just want to get more passionate. As we close out this year, I don't want to get sleepy. I don't want to get into the holiday, you know, malay. And no, I want to be passionate. Look at that. Look at how many people are raising their hands. What's up, y'all? I just finished preaching my message. It was about not having lukewarm faith. I'm still in the lobby because we don't hang out with lukewarm people. Look at how many people are passionate. It's one of the things that we love about the Life Church New York. We have a lot of passion. What's up, y'all? You good? You good? You're not lukewarm, are you? It's not lukewarm. So we got a lot of people that are still hanging around, and we want to make sure that you're a part of our journey. We're moving to Mamaroneck in a couple of weeks. Come on, Life Church New York, subscribe. Thank you.